Good morning, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. There is a uh, slight differentiation between the Hebrew lunar calendar and the solar calendar, but also thanks to the quadra, the Simeon schism in the fourth century, when the day of resurrection was moved to Easter, a feast of Ashtaroth, the first Sunday after the vernal equinox. It's not exactly Pentecost, only by the Christian calendar. Uh, although Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and 1 Corinthians all make it clear that Jesus rose from the dead in the month of Nisan at Hag Pesach, he died and he rose from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits, Yom Rishon of Hag Matzot. Uh, in the patristic age, the church decided, no, that's not when it happened. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and 1 Corinthians are wrong. It was the first Sunday after the equinox. So they reckoned Pentecost from that time. So it really isn't Pentecost, but don't tell anybody. Hag <laughs> <laughs> uh, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Hag Shavuot. So, We'll put on a little show for the camera and we'll pray in Hebrew as well as in English. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your word, for its eternal truths. We ask today, Lord God, that you'll speak to us from your word by the power of your spirit, speaking only through a man, a vessel by your unmerited grace. We need to hear from you, not from Jacob or from anyone else, Lord. Speak to us by your spirit, through your word. And more than this, Lord God, give us the wisdom and courage to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also. In the name of the one who saved us, the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Avinu makenu, unachtu rotsim lishma ala kol shelcha, tishpoch rochachecha aleinu akshav. Unachtu rotsim levekesh mimha, hameretz vehochma, lo rak lishma, aval gam ken la ostot lefi ma shekatuv bedrecha, behag shavuot, Amen. All right, please turn with me to the book of Leviticus, chapter 23. Pentecost, past, present, and future. The Feast of Weeks. Hi. You've come a long way from Iowa. I didn't even see you. I used to lock her with the other kids in the closet in her church in Iowa. <laughs> Chapter 23 of Leviticus. In Hebrew, Vayikra, and Yahweh called, and Yahweh called. We'll begin, please, looking at this from verse 15. You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day when you bought in the sheaf of the wave offering at Pesach time, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring it in from your dwelling places, two loaves of bread for a wave offering, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be a fine flour baked with leaven. Usually leaven is a figure of something negative, of sin, of pride. This is an exception. Along with the bread, you shall present seven one-year-old male lambs without defect, and a bull of the herd and two rams. They are to be burnt offerings to the Lord, with the grain offering and the drink offering, an offering by fire, a soothing aroma to the Lord. You shall also offer one male goat and for a sin offering, and two male lambs, one year old, for a sacrifice of a peace offering. The priest shall then wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering with two lambs before the Lord. They are to be holy to the Lord for the priest. On this same day, you shall make a proclamation. As well, you are to have a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work, it is to be a perpetual statute in all your dwelling places throughout all your generations. When you reap the harvest of the land, moreover, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor gather the gleaning of the harvest. You are to leave them for the needy and the alien. I am the Lord your God. 
Let's examine some of these features. First of all, you have the pattern of 7 times 7. Whenever you see this 7 times 7, when you look at the text midrashically, you have a common ground. On our purpose today, I'm simply pointing out that it exists. Daniel's 70 weeks. 7 years times 7. 7 sets of 70, 490 years. Same pattern, 49, 490. You shall forgive your brother 70 times 7. When you see the same numerical pattern, there is a theological relationship between those texts. They have some common ground. Now, it's not our purpose to elaborate upon it today. I merely point it out in passing because it happens to be within the text. This period of time is called the Omer, the Omer, having to do with the harvest. You count it. Scripturally, you count it from the Sabbath. Jesus having been crucified on a Friday, that Sabbath, when the Song of Solomon is read in the synagogues, is the Sabbath before the Sunday, Yom Rishon of Hagmatzot, when he would have raised from the dead. That's when you begin counting the Omer. On the 33rd day of the Omer is something that Jews celebrate called Lagba Omer, but it's largely rabbinic. It does not have much biblical significance, but in Judaism they attribute much to it, largely because of Kabbalah and tradition. I don't pay it much mind, but it's there. The counting of the Omer parallels the spring harvest. Remember, all of these holy days that God gave to Israel, he gave for three reasons. The first reason was, it was a polemic against paganism. The Canaanites had feasts on the same day because the calendar was civil, religious, and agricultural. The Canaanites were thanking other gods for the rain, the sun, and the harvest. Yahweh wanted his people to thank him. It was a polemic against paganism. Second reason, it engendered faith. It recounted the things he did for them in the past to encourage them, exhort them, to have the faith to trust him for the present and the future. Jews would always look back to the Exodus, always look back to his provision in the wilderness when they observed the Feast of Tabernacles. Always remember the things God did for us in the past, beginning with our coming out of Egypt, our salvation. Always remember the needs he's met, the blessings he's given us, the jams he's gotten out, us out of. Sometimes jams we've gotten ourselves into, but he very graciously got us out of. Always remember what he did for us in the past, commemorate it. Because it's a thing that God will use to give us the faith, the trust, and for the present and the future. Okay. Third aspect, what a theologian would call Hal's Geschichte. Salvation history. Jesus primarily fills the spring holy days in his first coming, with only a partial fulfillment of the autumn holy days in his first coming. He primarily fulfills the autumn holy days in his second coming, with a partial refulfillment of the spring ones. So, in other words, Passover, first fruits, Pentecost. He fulfills in his first coming. He only fulfills Yom Kippur, trumpets and tabernacles partially in his first coming. We have tapes explaining this. The rest still has to be fulfilled. But there is also a partial refulfillment of the spring holy days. There will be another last supper at Passover. The good and faithful servant will give the proper food at the proper time the exodus being a type of the rapture. That's why they brought Joseph's bones with them out of Egypt. Most of you know these things. As Pharaoh's magicians counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron, that's what the Antichrist and false prophet are going to do. You will have another kind of Pentecost, uh, Passover. But you will also have another resurrection day. Ours. Jesus is the first fruit of it. Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection. Remember, Hebrews chapter 1, the rapture and resurrection have already begun. The resurrection of Christ and the ascension of Christ, the rapture and resurrection have already begun with him. He is the 
prototype. It's already begun. The way I explain this is D-Day, Normandy invasion. Officially, D-Day was June 6th, but American and British commandos began operations on back of the German lines on June 5th. Those who were in the know understood that the Normandy invasion actually began on the 5th of June. It just became obvious on the 6th. Well, it's the same thing. To those who are in Christ, we know the resurrection and rapture are already underway. That is why the term last days is used, the eschatos. We're already in the last days. It's the age of the church. Okay. When Christians say last days, they're not reading Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 very carefully. Last days, latter days, is the age of the church. What most people think of as latter days, the last seven years of history and the events leading up to it, that is called in Greek the close of the age. The close of the age. We're already in the last days, but the close of the age is the final seven years of history and the events leading up to it, which I believe we're in. Okay, not in somewhere in the seven years, but certainly in the period leading up to it. I hope that's clear to everyone. I've explained these things in other teachings, so I don't want to go too deeply, but Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, the Patek HaShavua, the portion of the week. So, you have a Pentecost past and a Pentecost future, but let's go a bit further with this. You see, it's the harvest. The Omer is the counting for the harvest. To this day, the Megillah Ruth, the book of Ruth, is read in the synagogues on Hag Shavuot. Why? A rich, powerful Jewish man takes a Gentile bride and exalts her. This begins the royal line of David, the house of David, the royal line of Israel's kingship, the regal line of Israel, comes from a union of Jew and Gentile because the Messiah would be savior of both Jew and Gentile, the house of David, the messianic line, had to come from a union of both Jew and Gentile. We explain this on our teaching in the book of Ruth. That's what's read in the synagogues this week. Uh, you can think of the fourth chapter of Ruth as Matthew chapter zero. Matthew chapter 0. The genealogy of Jesus does not begin in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. It begins in the final six verses of the book of Ruth. Matthew 1.1 1, 1 just picks up exactly where Ruth leaves, leaves off. You can call what is read in the synagogues this week Matthew chapter 0. A baby is born in Bethlehem who's called Goel in Hebrew, Redeemer. And it says in Ruth, he's going to be famous. Now, who's born in Bethlehem, who's famous, who's the Redeemer? <laughs> from this comes the Shortish Ishai, the root of Jesse. The royal line of Israel would come from this again. We have teachings explaining it. I'm only pointing it out relative to Pentecost, to Hag Shavuot, to the Feast of Weeks. Well, let's go just a little bit further with this. So we have the Omer, the agricultural aspect culminating with the reading of the scroll of Ruth, Jew and Gentile united to begin the royal line of Israel to which the Messiah would come as the Redeemer from Bethlehem. That's today. Unsaved Jewish people have this in their liturgy, a special liturgy called a Machzor. They have it in their heritage, their culture. They're reading this stuff. They're reading the book of Ruth and they have no idea what it means. No idea what it means. Believers should know what it means. Well, let's continue looking at this then. What Pentecost is not. The founder, the, well, I shouldn't say the founder, but the primary doctrinal patriarch of Roman Catholicism and of Reformed Protestantism and Lutheranism and Anglicanism is Augustine of Hippo and those who influenced him, such as Cyprian of Carthage and Ambrose of Milan, but don't worry about that, just think of Augustine. 
Would Constantine pseudo-Christianize the Roman Empire for his political agenda? My apologies to those who know this. Christianity had to be reframed. Remember, Christianity began in Israel as a Judaic faith, a fulfillment of the Torah by the Messiah as atonement and giver of eternal life. It began in Israel as a faith. In Greece, it became a philosophy, initially Platonic. In Italy, in Rome, it became a political empire. And in Texas, it became a 5013C tax-deductible corporation. <laughs> <laughs> they just grabbed Benny Hinn's records last week with a court order, didn't they? <laughs> Well, so we go to Augustine. It's the religion of the empire. Sprinkle all the babies. What had been Christianity becomes Christendom. Instead of the ecclesia, the called out ones, now it is an institutional religion of the empire. That's why Constantine Christianized. He had a political agenda for doing it. He was trying to stop a fragmentation between the Latin West and the Greek East. So what he said was this. Augustine took one verse and changed one word. The parable of the wheat and tares. In the parable it says, the field is the world. Let the believers and unbelievers grow together. The Lord will sort it out at the end. Augustine changes one word of one verse. The field is the church. The church is made up of those who are born again and those who aren't. Let God sort it out. Sprinkle all the babies and make them Christian. They make baptism the equivalent of circumcision. Bring everybody into the covenant. So what do you do now? Well, they had no choice to accept Christ. So what do we do now? Let's see, we've got to find something. I know, it's Pentecost. We'll tell everybody they need their personal Pentecost and we'll call it the Sacrament of Confirmation. <laughs> That's not what Pentecost is. That's what certain church traditions made it for the reasons I told you. Lutherans, Anglicans, certainly the Roman Church, they have this confirmation thing. Well, okay, you were sprinkled as a baby, so what are we gonna do now? They never accepted Christ personally, but they're already Christian. <laughs> it's a big problem. We're baptized into his death. Who in their right mind would take a baby and put it into a coffin and bury it if it wasn't dead. <laughs> so they had to cook something up. So they turned Pentecost into something the scripture never teaches. Now I don't say that to offend Catholics or to offend Anglicans or to offend Lutherans. I simply point it out because it's the truth. That's not what Pentecost is. Pentecost is not a personal confirmation. And a personal confirmation is not Pentecost. That's what it is not. What is it? We know from Jewish history, Pentecost past, the Feast of Weeks, is the day the Torah was given on Mount Sinai. And according to the Mishnah, when the Torah was given, a whirlwind was heard from heaven, and based on the table of nations in Genesis 10, 70 tongues, 70 languages were heard. This is in the Mishnah. It's in Jewish history. Now, it's not canon, but it's history. Therefore, on the day of Pentecost, as Christians would call it, that is, Pentecost present, the same phenomena of languages was heard again because it was a sign to the Jews that the new covenant had been given on the same day as the old one. It was a sign to the Jews. And it's not to limit 
tongues to Jews, but it is to say Jews seek a sign, and that's what happened. The way the early church understood this was as follows. Man lost his unity because of sin at Babel, the Tower of Babel. The way the early Christians understood what happened on the day of Pentecost with the multiplicity of languages, that unity was restored in Christ. You understand that they each heard the praises of God in their own language. The early Christians saw it as a reversal of Babylon. So right from the beginning, you had this conflict that begins in the book of Jeremiah, but it comes into the church right from the beginning, a conflict between Jerusalem and Babylon. A conflict, a thematic conflict, and a spiritual conflict between Jerusalem and Babylon. The birthplace of false religion being Babylon. That'll climax with Babylon the Great in the book of Revelation. So when tongues happens, they see it as reversing this curse. Christ has given us back the unity that man lost. We can hear his praises in his own language. I've got to go back to Vietnam in a few weeks. These people are on little rice, well, they're on straw mats with little cups of rice and chopsticks, enthusiastically listening to the Word of God. Their church does not resemble this church. Go to a mission in Africa, a place called Lupopo, Lupopo, and they actually pound on the drums instead of a church bell, they pound on the drums and the people come and they sit on rocks. <laughs> they sit on rocks. When I was a hippie, it was Jesus freaks, like Chuck Smith. You had all of these hippies. You know, you had acid freaks and you had speed freaks. Now you got Jesus freaks. And these young people came with their guitars and their blue jeans and the long hair. They'd sit on the floor and listen to Chuck Smith. That's how Calvary Chapels began. I've seen such incredible diversity among Christians, culturally. Outwardly, they had nothing in common, but one faith, one baptism. They all believed the same thing. They all had the second birth. They all had the same spirit. They all worshipped the same God. They all had faith in the same Jesus who saved them. They all believed the same scripture. Inwardly, internally, they were the same. Externally, they would look like completely diverse, different religions. <laughs> Babylon is the opposite. You go to a Catholic Mass in Korea, you can go to a Catholic Mass in Argentina, you go to a Catholic Mass in Georgia. Nomine Padre cum Filia cum Spiritu Santo, Adeum qui leitificat juventut en meum. Misere a tutu omnipotens Deus et imisis peccatis tuis perducate et vicem eternam. <laughs> et te misa es, Deo gracias. Go the Mass is ended. Thanks be to God. <laughs> That's literally what the Latin means. <laughs> they want unity based on the outward. False religion wants an outward unity. God doesn't care about that. He accepts the fact in Revelation 7, they come from all tribes, nations, and cultures. It's one faith, one baptism. It's not this uniform. Well, Pentecost, something happens. That was Pentecost past. Only when the law was given, when the Torah was given, 3,000 fell. When the Holy Spirit was given, 3,000 were saved. The Torah means the way, the law. The primary purpose of the law was to demonstrate to us, through the example of Israel and the Jews, that we can't keep it. Because of our fallen nature, we are incapable of keeping God's law. 
the biggest section of the Torah was a Levitical sacrificial system to make atonement for the fact you couldn't keep the rest of it. And that could only give a temporary provision for sin until the Messiah came. It could give kapara as in Yom Kippur. They had to wait for the Messiah to come and remove the sin. The purpose of the law was to demonstrate through the example of Israel and the Jews that we are fallen, that we cannot keep God's law, therefore we need a Messiah who can keep it on our behalf and who could atone for the fact that we can't keep it. It was our tutor to point us to Christ. So the law was given on this day to point us to Christ. And he promises Pentecost. Now let's look at something. Turn with me please to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20. In verse 22, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. At that point, the apostles were born again. They were regenerate. Christ had died and rose, and they were regenerate. So why did Jesus go say, Wait for the Spirit? Go wait for something you've just received. In regeneration, there is a reception of the Holy Spirit on a personal basis, as individuals, one-on-one. -on -one. In second birth, we receive the Holy Spirit as individuals. Pentecost continued in spirit baptism. was a corporate reception. You understand? The church was now united and empowered. We can think of it this way. The church only existed embryonically prior to Pentecost. It was born on Pentecost. Before Pentecost, it existed only embryonically. Before Pentecost, there were individual believers but they were not united as one body until Pentecost. <laughs> in regeneration, the function of the Holy Spirit is focused on the individual. In Pentecost, it's focused on the body, corporate. But more than that, what are the purposes of Pentecost and what began then? Let's look and see what the biblical purposes of Pentecost, if it's not confirmation. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16. In verse 13, But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. This tells us certain things about the Holy Spirit. One, our faith is not pneumocentric, it is Christocentric. In other words, the Holy Spirit always points people to Jesus, never himself. He never speaks on his own authority. He is God. He's a person of the triunity of the Godhead. Trinity, if you prefer that term. And he is worshipped as God in the context of the Trinity. Holy, holy, holy God in three persons. But as we've warned many times, 
he is never worshipped outside of the context of the triunity. All of this you see today, good morning Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, let your fire fall, we worship you Holy Spirit, none of that is scriptural, none of it. We pray to the Father in the name of the Son through the Spirit. He always points people to Jesus, never to himself. When people begin praying pneumocentrically, the Holy Spirit very easily becomes counterfeited by an alien spirit. This is what you see happening with Bill Johnson in Reading. This is what you saw at these counterfeit revivals in Toronto and Pensacola. A counterfeiting of the Holy Spirit. Most Christians only think of Antichrist, not just against Christ, but in the Greek in place of Christ. They do not realize there's a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is being counterfeited always by the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. Today it's new age getting into the church. Eastern religious philosophy. That's what's on back of the emergent church. That's what's on back of these things like the Lectio Divina and contemplative prayer, this is the zeitgeist, it's the spirit of the age, Eastern religion invading Western Christendom, what Isaiah chapter 2 warns against. Ultimately, a person will counterfeit the Holy Spirit. The same as the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, will counterfeit Christ. The false prophet will counterfeit the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the true vicar of Christ. He is the true vicar of Christ. He and he alone is the one who behaves vicariously in place of Christ, no one else. What the Roman papacy is, is a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit, claiming as the head of the magisterium of the Roman system, that he's infallible when he speaks from the chair of Peter, ex cathedra. This is a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit, you understand? Jesus tells us in John 16, it is the Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth, not a pope. You have obvious discrepancies, the most common one being Mary. In the Magnificat, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Your son's going to be the Savior. He'll save his people from their sin. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary replies with, Oh no, the Pope is the vicar of Christ, and he says Mary's got it wrong. Munificentissimus Deus, the Immaculate Conception. She doesn't need a Savior. Yeah, but the scripture says all have sinned, but not Mary. She's Theotokos, the mother of God. Yeah, who's God's father? <laughs> These things all come from Babylon. You understand, the Holy Spirit is counterfeited. Because you have a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit, you have a counterfeit Pentecost. The stuff you see in Reading with Johnson, and this is mysticism. This is a counterfeit Pentecost. Traditional Pentecostalism was not like this. When crazy people tried to hijack early Pentecostalism, when people like Amy McPherson on Arthur Rocker and, 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 and Kenyon and, and, and William Branham and E.W. Kenyon and the proponents of the latter day reign and all this, the 1940s and 50s, mainstream Pentecostalism rejected this stuff. The Assemblies of God rejected it as heretical. Now what they once rejected as a counterfeit Pentecost, they're propagating. <laughs> they're propagating a false Pentecost. The same denominations that once opposed this stuff are now proponents of it. This is apostasy. Well, let's continue. So we have Pentecost past and Pentecost present in the church. What happens in Pentecost present? 
He guides us into all truth. The Holy Spirit guides. He guides us into all truth. Notice the truth comes first. When Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them in the truth, thy word is truth. There was once an English keynote speaker at a house church conference in the United States. And I was there with another brother from England who was a good Bible teacher. And we heard what this person was saying. And they were saying, Jesus prayed we would be one. And we were saying, look, the ecumenical movement, people with a different gospel, we should not be united with them. But Jesus prayed we would be one. Yeah, he prefaced that prayer the high priestly prayer, by saying, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. The unity of the Spirit requires truth. He's not the spirit of error. He's the spirit of truth. He guides us into truth. And of course, Jesus is the truth. He's the word of God incarnate. Remember, the scripture is Jesus in print. Jesus is the scripture incarnate, the Logos. Leads us into truth. That is, Jesus is the truth. You cannot have the unity of the spirit where there is fundamentally false doctrine or a different gospel. You cannot. You cannot. His second function. John 16, 13, look at it again. He will disclose to you what is to come. He will disclose to you what is to come. The occult counterfeits the gifts of the Spirit. Okay. But what happens when a cult gets into the church? As I've been warned many times, Mormons pray in tongues, charismatic Catholics pray in tongues to marry. We live in an age where people have made things the barometer of orthodoxy that are not. Despite the fact you have someone like Peter Ruckman, the King James only guru on his third marriage, they overlook his adulterous marriages. He reads the King James. As long as you read the King James, you're kosher. And people do that. I remember when Rodney Howard Brown and Kenneth Copeland were clowning in tongues. Rodney Howard Brown said, how many of you speak in tongues? Tongues becomes the barometer. Must be kosher. They're doing it in tongues. They make tongues the barometer. There are people today, and I'm not trying to speak divisively to the issue, but there are people today that will make pre-tribulationism the barometer. As long as you're pre-trib, they'll accept you. There's a guy, Randy White. He says the church is not under the new covenant. He says that the seven churches in Revelation are seven Jewish synagogues in the future. He's a hyper-dispensationalist, a Bollingerist. But he's accepted and promoted by people like Jan Markell, simply because he's pre-trib. Now, I believe in tongues. <laughs> I believe in a lot of the, but that's not the barometer. That's not the barometer. The barometer is scriptural truth, rightly dividing the word of God, and the Holy Spirit illuminates the scripture for us, but he does something else. 
as we've explained multiple times, I can't even play rugby. Apocalypse means unveiling. There's no new truth, it's already there. But the closer we get to the return of Jesus, the more the curtain goes up. You've heard me say this. For the faithful church, the closer we get to the return of Christ, the more the curtain goes up. For the harlot church, the more the curtain comes down. You understand? Faithfulness has its gauge in understanding in the last days. None of the wicked will understand what's told in Daniel. Okay. The foolish virgins will not be able to see in the dark. For the faithful church, the curtain will go up. For the unfaithful church, it'll come down. The things in Daniel, he's told to seal them to the appropriate time. The book of Revelation made almost no sense throughout much of the history of the church. But the more we read it now, the clearer it becomes. Why is that? The Holy Spirit discloses the future. Now again, the occult counterfeits charismatic gifts. But the counterfeiting is not only with people with crystal balls and Ouija boards and horoscopes. I've said 10,000 times, so much of what is called prophecy today in the church is really clairvoyance. So much of what is called prophecy today is merely clairvoyance. They are prophesying the futility and deception of their own mind. This is not to reject the biblical gift of prophecy. The ministry of the Holy Spirit will be not just to illuminate the scriptures, but in the last days, that takes on an expanded dimension. He shows us what is going to happen before it happens. That day should not overtake us like a thief. Oh, he's coming like a thief in the night. Yeah. But it's not supposed to be something we don't anticipate. That day should not overtake us like a thief. We'll overtake the world and the heart of the church like a thief. The Holy Spirit will be showing the faithful church what these events mean. Let's continue. John 16, 14. He will glorify me, never himself. He glorifies Jesus the Son. Our faith is always Christocentric, not pneumocentric. Forget about come Holy Spirit, let your fire fall. No, it's Father send your spirit in the name of your Son Jesus. He glorifies Jesus, not himself. Remember 1 Corinthians. The church that was the most charismatic was the most carnal. The church that spoke, and Paul wrote instructively the most about the Holy Spirit, was the one who understood him the least, even though they talked about him the most. Things have not changed much. I am a convinced non-cessationist. I believe the gifts of the Spirit still operate in the church understood and practiced biblically. Cessationism is a doctrinal error. People like John MacArthur are dead wrong. Dead wrong. I believe in these gifts. 
What does Paul say? When the ungifted in Greek idiotai, he used the word, uses the word idiot, when the ungifted or the unbelieving enter and see the charismania, as Chuck Smith used to call it, instead of charismata, will they not say you are mad? Now, if you don't know, the theological term for what Chuck Smith colloquially referred to as charismania, the theological term is neomontanism. Neomontanism. That's the theological term for hyper charismatic extremism. And Bill Johnson in Toronto and all that nonsense. It's neomontanism. So we see he glorifies the sun, he discloses the future, he guides us into the doctrinal truth. But then there's more. Look with me, please, to Acts chapter 1, verse 5. In Hebrew, the book of Acts is interesting. It's called Maaseh Hashlichim. Maaseh Hashlichim. Literally, what the apostles did. It's the book of what the apostles did in Hebrew. Acts chapter 1, please, verse 5. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Remember, when he breathed on them, they received the Holy Spirit. When God created Adam, he breathed on Adam, and Adam became a living soul, remember? When Jesus breathed on the apostles, that was the new creation, the creation and the new creation. The same God does the same thing breathes on them. Okay. But the Holy Spirit's going to do something else now. He's going to unite. Up until now, they had the Holy Spirit as individuals. The 120 did anyway. Now God's going to do something corporate, of a corporate consequence. Now look at verse 8 of Acts chapter 1, please. But you will receive power, dunamis, when the Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. It begins in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where Satan got his biggest defeat. It is where he will get his final defeat. It is from there Christ will reign in the millennium. Let's continue. To Judea. The area around Jerusalem, southern Israel. Okay. Samaria. The mongrel Jews. Those who combined Judaism with paganism, going back to Sanballat, going back to the Assyrian captivity, where a hybrid of Judaism and Assyrian paganism became the Samaritan religion. We can think of the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church much the same. It is a hybrid of Christianity with the pontifical religions of pagan Rome. Okay? It is a hybrid. They believed some true things, as did the Samaritans, but they believed false things. Jesus said, salvation comes from the Jews. You believe error. Now, separate subject, we have a teaching called the woman at the well. We explain it. But you shall receive power, and then it to the ends of the earth. God begins with the Jews, then the mongrel Jews, and then the Gentile nations. Boom, boom, boom. Concentric circles. Okay. But beginning in Jerusalem as the epicenter. Okay. Then to the remotest parts of the earth. Places that they didn't even know existed. Now look at this. You shall receive dunamas. 
the Holy Spirit unites and empowers. He unites and empowers. There are people who are monotones, who are hopeless public speakers because they're monotones. It's easier to read them than to listen to them for many people. But I've heard monotones who God used because they were open to the power of the Spirit and Spirit baptism. On the other hand, there are people who are extroverts. But all they are, really, is hype. <laughs> no real anointing. Where the Holy Spirit really is, there is a power. The apostles could not preach with power. So what I'm saying is, Pentecost, unlike regeneration, regeneration is purely personal. Pentecost is both personal and corporate. How do we understand this? Very simply. How good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Look with me, please, to Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Now watch the typology. It's like the precious oil, the anointing of the Spirit, upon the head, coming down upon the head, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robe. Different liquids typify the Holy Spirit in different aspects of his person and ministry. You've heard me explain this. New wine, living water, here it's shemen, oil, the anointing of the Spirit. Notice the oil does not touch the flesh. Goes down the beard, onto the robe. <laughs> okay. Lord, Lord, did we not do miracles in your name? Yeah, you did. You did them in my name. But that was something I was doing. It has nothing to do with you. You're not known by your gifts. You're known by your fruit. It doesn't touch the flesh. To have the anointing, the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Anointing of the Spirit is empowering for ministry. You must be under the head and attached to the body. You see that? You must be under the head and attached to the body. Remember, the Aaronic High Priest is a type of Christ, a picture of Christ, according to Hebrews. To have the genuine anointing and powering of the Holy Spirit, you must be under the headship of Christ and a part of his body. <laughs> a hand is useless unless it's attached to the body. A foot is useless. Everything is useless unless it's attached to the body and under the head. That is Pentecost. The individual and the corporate. You understand? The eye is the lamp of the body. And it's teachers. They can see. Okay. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Ephesians 6, charge your feet with the shoes of the gospel of peace. They're evangelists. Feet the evangelists. A foot is ridiculous. Unless it's attached to a leg. <laughs> An eye is no good unless it's in the head. <laughs> Okay.
you must be under the head and attached to the body or it doesn't count. That's Pentecost. He unites and empowers. Now remember, Jesus said, well, concerning the John the Baptist said, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. If somebody is leading a spirit-filled life, they're not going to live in immorality. Like many people of my generation, I came from the drug culture. If I had a biochemistry exam, I'd take enough speed to win the fifth at Hollywood Park. You know? <laughs> Hit the book. That's how I got through. That's how I kept in my exams. I was strung out on cocaine as a kid. Not proud of it, but that's what Jesus saved me from. I didn't see it as a problem. I saw it as a lifestyle choice. I saw fornication as a lifestyle choice. I didn't see it as a problem. Society said I had a drug problem. No, I had a sin problem. <laughs> Cocaine had such a power over me. It was more important to me than anything. It was virtually my God, functionally. The only thing stronger than my false God was the true God. <laughs> it was the Holy Spirit who empowered me to stop taking illegal drugs. It delivered me from this addiction. 12-step program. Hello, my name is Jacob. <laughs> Hi, Jacob! <laughs> and I'm a recovering alcoholic. Hi, my name is Jacob. Hi, Jacob! I'm not a recovering cocaine addict. That poor loser is dead. I'm a new creation in Christ. <laughs> born of the spirit if you don't see moral living it is not a spirit filled life we all drop our crosses we all have our faults and mistakes but if you see somebody habitually living in some addiction or immorally or, you've got people in pulpits who are divorced and remarried with no scriptural grounds for doing so They're devoid of the Spirit of God. Oh, God might be using them. Lord, did we not do this in your name? The oil does not touch the flesh. He empowers us to live morally. I was shacking up with my girlfriend. You can't live that way anymore. Wake up in the morning, roll the joint, take a shot of Coke. You stop doing that. Do not believe the purpose-driven lie. That is not of his spirit. The purpose-driven lie says when you see somebody living immorally or into substance abuse, just tell them they need Jesus in their life. Be seeker-friendly. Don't tell them about repentance. Once Jesus comes into their life, he'll clean them up. That's what he teaches. That's what Warren teaches in his book. No, no, no. He confuses justification with sanctification. If somebody doesn't repent, Jesus isn't coming into their life. It is a formula for false conversion. Repent and believe. Save yourself from this perverse generation. A false gospel is being peddled today. Galatians 1. If an angel of God comes with a false gospel, they are anathema, a curse of God. A curse to God. I don't mean that which is obviously false, like the Roman church that says you have to atone for your own sins in purgatory. That's an obvious false gospel. I mean what comes into evangelical circles, the seeker-friendly stuff. It's a false gospel. Let's continue. This area, Loma Linda, loaded with Seventh-day Adventists. I once met the rock and roll singer in L.A., Little Richard, gave me his book. First half of the book was all scriptural. 
looked like any evangelical could have written it. Second half of the book, all dietary legalism. Trying to live under two covenants at the same time, like the Galatians. The, the extreme access of the Messianic movement is the same. They're putting Gentiles under the law. They're lifting up Jewishness instead of Yeshua-ness. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's another gospel. Well, let's look at this. He guides us into truth, discloses the future, glorifies Jesus the Son, and unites and empowers the church. But there's just a little bit more. Let's look carefully. Back to John 16, please. This is for believers. Now, let's look what he does since Pentecost for non-believers. John 16, commencing in verse 8, please. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. He convicts the world concerning righteousness. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. Satan was defeated at the cross. He will be ultimately destroyed with the return of Christ. But he can't win anymore. Concerning sin, because they do not believe me. He convicts. For us he guides, discloses, illuminates. For the world, he convicts. Concerning sin, Righteousness Judgment An unsaved person Who you share your faith with Witness to them Give them a tract Give them your testimony Preach the gospel to them Whatever Conviction Important term in Greek. Get this. Eklentos. Convicts. Now understand what this means. Concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Unless a non-believer is convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment, they're not going to get saved. Understand the two big errors that derive from a wrong understanding of Pentecost. One is Pelagianism. It denies original sin. It has a sanitized version that some evangelicals bought into called Finneyism. Came from Charles Finney. That's why I never quote him. The other is hyper-Calvinism. Both of these things are toxins. An unsaved person is the spiritual equivalent of a corpse. They cannot choose Christ. They're spiritually dead. It's impossible for them to choose Christ. It requires an eclenctos, an act of divine intervention. He puts a measure of life into them. He resuscitates the corpse, convicting them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Once that corpse has been resuscitated, some Bibles translate it as quickened, a measure of life is put back into the corpse. A 
at that point they're convicted, then they must choose. They cannot choose of their own merit because they're dead through sin. Jesus said, I chose you, you didn't choose me. But once the eclentos takes place, God puts enough life back in that corpse to make it possible for them to choose. You understand? Do not believe the Phineasts or the Pelagians who say people can choose Christ. Neither believe the hyper-Calvinists who say the Lord created some for heaven and some for hell. They actually say, they actually say that regeneration precedes faith. You don't get faith until you've been born again. No, no, you're saved by grace through faith. You must be quickened. When you're quickened, when you have the eclentos, when you're convicted, then you have faith to trust Jesus for your salvation. Faith comes before regeneration, not after it. Do not believe the poison of hyper-Calvinism. Neither believe its diametric opposite, the poison of Phineism. Neither one are scriptural. What is scriptural is eclentos. He convicts of sin righteousness and judgment now what happens at the end of the age remember he breathed on them and he said receive the spirit the Holy Spirit is never taken from the hearts of God's people never the restrainer is the Holy Spirit but that doesn't mean he's taken. In Greek it just means he stops restraining. Christ had three and a half years. Satan demands equal time to Antichrist and he gets three and a half years. Separate but related subject. He will no longer convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's only in the hearts of God's people now. The church is no longer united or empowered. The church at the end of the age will be like it was before Pentecost. Waiting for the Spirit. At the end of the age, when the Spirit stops restraining, we're waiting for Jesus. That is the reason you do not see the church after Revelation chapter 3. There'll be believers, but there won't be the church as it's existed since Pentecost. You've got a 10-day period between the Ascension and Pentecost. That is the spring equivalent of the 10-day period between the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of the Atonement, Day of Atonement, of uh, of Yom Kippur, but Rosh Hashanah they call it now for the trumpets, but that's not the biblical name, and the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. There's a 10 day period called the Yamim Hanoraim. I'm thinking in Hebrew, <laughs> trying to put it into English. The Day of Atonement is preceded by a 10 day period from the Feast of, of Trumpets, today called Yom Kippur. Well, you got that 10 day period in the spring, and you got such a 10 day period in the autumn. These are terrible days. The apostles were powerless. They were just waiting. At the end, the church will be powerless. Work while you have the night uh, light. Night will come, no man can work. Okay? <laughs> just do what you can. It's going to stop. Now again, I only mention these things in passing. He convicts. He will stop doing this. When this happens, and the church is removed, we have Pentecost future. God then turns his purposes back to Israel and the Jews. 
The doctrine of tribulation saints is greatly overstated. Almost everything the scripture tells us in both testaments. Once the faithful church is removed, once the parousia happens, the purposes of God are refocused on Israel and the Jews primarily. The time of the Gentiles is over. Okay? The age of the church is over. Now, the autumn holy days are going to be fulfilled. Okay? That's what's going to happen. Okay. God goes back to dealing the way he did in the Old Testament. The age of grace is over. Once the church is removed, it is the orge, not the ellipsis, not tribulation, but orge, the wrath of God. We are not appointed to wrath. He pours out his wrath on the kingdom of Antichrist, and he makes it his intent on saving the, the faithful remnant of Israel. That's what happens. Okay. The Holy Spirit does not operate then the way he does now. The age of grace will be over. Be over. Be very careful of John MacArthur now. John MacArthur says it will be possible to worship the Antichrist, worship the image of the beast, take the mark of the beast, and still be saved. And then he stands up there, denounces every charismatic and Pentecostal. Not just the lunatic fringe, he denounces all of them. He essentially slandered Chuck Smith, contradicted his own words, what he had said about Chuck Smith some decades ago. Now he says the opposite. And he himself is teaching very, very serious error. That you can worship the Antichrist? and still be saved? This is MacArthur. If possible, the elect will be deceived. You see, at one time, I would have said most of the heresy and lunacy in the church is sadly to be found among my fellow charismatics and Pentecostals. Not anymore. You've got these fundamentalist cessationists who are as crazy as anybody. Maybe even worse. What a thing to say. To rail against the gifts of the Spirit and rail against Chuck Smith and rail against people who are charismatic and, 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 and be teaching that you can take the mark of the beast and worship the Antichrist and be saved. They've lost it. Lost it. It's lunacy. He will stop convicting the world. He will deal with Israel. He will pour out his judgments the way he did on Egypt in the Exodus. Let's talk now about Pentecost future. We had Pentecost past, Pentecost present, Peter's charisma, the age of the church. Now let's talk about Pentecost future. Turn with me, please, to the book of Joel, Yoel Hanavi. Verse 28, it'll come about after this. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh or on all mankind. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. I'll display wonders on the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, columns of smoke. Sun will be turned to darkness, moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. It'll come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls surviving the time of Jacob's trouble. From Jeremiah. Now, let's look at Peter's charisma 
and Pentecost, and this will be finishing soon. Look at the book of Acts chapter 2, Peter's Kerygma, the first evangelistic sermon, takes it right from the book of Joel. But this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel in verse 16. This was like that. It shall be in the last days, says the Lord, I'll pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall see dream dreams. Now, there was nothing on Pentecost to do with dreams or visions. Even upon my bondservants, with men and women in those days, I will pour forth my spirit, and I'll prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below. There was tongues coming as a whirlwind from heaven, but the sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it will come about that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There was no blood and fire and smoke. The sun was not turned dark. The moon was not turned to blood. That didn't happen on the day of Pentecost. The age of the church, Pentecost present. But Revelation tells us it happens in Pentecost future. Let's go back to the 70. 70 times 7. 7 times 7. We did a teaching called the year of Jubilee. Hashanah HaYovel. We explained the Shemitah. If you're interested in the mathematics of this, I explain it in some depth on that recorded teaching. Let's look at this. Some examples. We'll be finishing shortly. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter... Four. He's in the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown. He opens the Megillah, the scroll, and he begins to read from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and he closed the book that is he rolled up the scroll gave it back to the attendant and the eyes of all were fixed on him and he sat down. Why? Well, some of you obviously know why. Let's look at Isaiah 61 in case you don't know why. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news, the gospel, besorah, to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of God and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. He only read the first half of verse 2. And instead of completing the verse, he closed the book. He rolled up the scroll and sat down. Why didn't he finish reading it? Because to bring vengeance, that is the orge, the wrath of God. That's his purpose in his second coming, not his first. He only reads what he's going to fulfill up to then. The rest still has to happen. Let's look at another example. Turn with me, please, again to the Gospel of St. John. At best of Abel Pei Yochanan in Hebrew, John 19, verse 37. He's hanging on the cross. And again, another scripture. They shall look upon him who they have pierced. Well, it quotes from Zechariah chapter 12. 
But you got the same problem. Look at Zechariah chapter 12. Verse 10. They'll look upon me who they have pierced and mourn as one mourns for an only son. Weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. They weren't weeping over him. They were yelling, crucify him. It only quotes the first half of the verse. The second half still has to happen. Look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Behold, he's coming. With the clouds, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be, amen. The second half happens when he returns. Zechariah 12.10, cut the verse in half. Isaiah 61, verse 2, cut the verse in half. Joel's vision and Peter's charisma cut it in half. It's partially fulfilled at his first coming. The rest is fulfilled at his second. Pentecost to come. The remnant of the Gentile nations that survive the last seven years and the one-third of the Jews who survive the other two-thirds won't. Judgments have always happened to the Jews and thirds, and having a Jewish-Israeli family, this is a painful subject for me. One-third of global Jewry was killed in the Holocaust, which was two-thirds of European Jewry. Judgments always happened in thirds. It goes back to Ezekiel. Remember, not a hair of your head shall perish, but Ezekiel had to shave the hair. One third of the hair he had to chop up with a sword because the third of the Jews would be killed by the sword by the Babylonians. One third he had to burn because one third would be asphyxiated when Nebuchadnezzar burned Jerusalem. And one third scattered to the breeze, one third of the hair, because the Jews would be scattered in the diaspora. There was a few hairs he had to tie to the fringe of his garment. Now the fringe of the Jews' garment is the tzitzit, the tassels for the commandments. In other words, the remnant of Israel, the faithful Jews, the ones who kept the word of God, the law of God, the law of God kept them, you understand? The rest either died by the sword or by the flame or were scattered. Judgments always happened in thirds based on Ezekiel. And that's historically played out even in the Holocaust. But Zechariah tells us at the end it'll be the same. Two thirds will die. One third will survive. And the remnant of the nations those are the people whose descendants will repopulate the earth in the millennium and so forth. That's Pentecost coming. That's going to happen. What you see happening, just last week, President Trump unfortunately did not keep his promise to move the embassy of the United States to Jerusalem. The politics of oil. Do I pray for him? Yes. But I'm very disappointed. Fortunately, I don't trust politicians to begin with. So I don't feel really let down, but I, I pray for him. I don't identify my Christian views with my political views, but I voted for him because I voted against Hillary Clinton. I didn't. <laughs> I would have preferred Governor Huckabee or Mike Pence or Ted Cruz. I just voted for him because I didn't want the, that terrible woman. But if she got elected, I would have prayed for her. The burden of the Lord concerning Israel. The Lord stretched out the heavens. Verse 2, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. When the siege is against Jerusalem, it'll be against Judah. 
And it'll come about on that day that I'll make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all the people. All who lift it will be severely injured. All. Zechariah is hearkening back to Obadiah 15. The nations who take the side of Israel's oppressors will experience the same thing Israel experiences. Islamic terror. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Nobody has ever persecuted the Jews or persecuted the faithful church and gotten away with it. You persecute the faithful church or you mess with the Jews, you touch the apple of God's eye. We've explained this many times. My sister's husband was killed in the World Trade Center on September 11th. I was in Jerusalem, and five minutes later, the place I was, a bus was blown up, killing 17 people. If I'd been there five minutes sooner, if I had not gotten out of there. A toy store where my wife used to take my children when they were babies, they threw hand grenades into it in Haifa. My wife could have been in there with my own infant children. Uh, my grandfather was born in Manchester, England. I used to live in Manchester, England. Our ministry, Moriel, has a church in Manchester, England. And last night it was London where I live. London, England. Uh, what is this? President Obama pressed Theresa May to vote against Israel in the UN with the UNESCO vote concerning Jerusalem. All who lift that stone will be hurt grievously. Not that I'm a prophet, but I warned, Britain is going to reap the repercussions of this. It is going to be an Obadiah 15 situation. This, you placate radical Islam, you watch what's going to happen now, Theresa May. I'm not a prophet, I just read the scriptures. Now again, my grandfather was from Manchester. I used to live there. We have a church there. I live in London. New York's my hometown. I don't say these things lightly. I take no delight in saying these things. I've been warning for years. Islam is a judgment of God on the Judeo-Christian world for turning away from him. The same as the Babylonians were, or the Philistines were on Israel. Said these things many times. I warned what was going to happen on Muriel TV, on Roku, and on YouTube. I said, this is what's going to happen. Fasten your seatbelt. Britain is going to get hit. And if Hillary had gotten elected, America would have been hit. But you know, it's not just Manchester. It's not just London. San Bernardino. Six blocks from where I stay in Redlands. They were living and planning to do this. And now federal judges say, you have to let people in from these countries even though you can't vet them because you'll violate their rights to come in here and kill people in San Bernardino. How do you account for this madness? It is the judgment of God. He is allowing this to happen. God's not doing it, but he is allowing it in judgment. Again, I lost family to terror. I don't say these things lightly. But how's it going to end? It's going to end on Pentecost. Zechariah tells us. Once again, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, on the Yishpoch al Bet David, Gam Yerushalayim, the spirit of grace and supplication, Haruach Shel Chesed. So they'll look upon me who they have pierced 
and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, they will weep bitterly over him, like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Yes, there will be another day of Pentecost. It's not the one that the latter day reign, lunatic fringe says, with a kingdom now, dominion theology, lunatic fringe says. It'll be this one. Those Gentiles from the nations who remain and that remnant of Israel will look upon the one who was pierced. He will pour out his spirit on them. Then the rest of Joel's vision will be fulfilled. It'll happen. It'll happen. The second half of Isaiah 61 2 will be fulfilled. Okay. It'll be fulfilled. The second half of Joel's vision will be fulfilled. This is the coming day of Pentecost. And so we have Pentecost past. Then we have Pentecost present that began in Acts 2. But that's winding up now. God is getting ready to turn his purposes back to Israel. The age of the church is drawing to a close. The time of the Gentiles is coming to an end. Another day of Pentecost draws near. Yeah, he'll pour out his spirit on all flesh, but that doesn't mean what these hype artists are telling you. It's something that will be incredible, but it's something that you don't want to be here for. You want to be gone when this happens. A day of Pentecost is indeed coming. But it's coming at a very, very dark time. Pentecost past, Pentecost present, Pentecost future. Hag. Shavuot Sameach. Happy Pentecost. Thank you for listening.